this world people tell me all your lectures are fine what about the pain what about the misery what about the suffering it doesn't tell the suffering is real because the pain and suffering is real does not mean the world is real it's a wrong assumption to make all right let's go back to the dream example in a dream somebody attacks you with a knife and inflicts the pain you howl and cry and you wake up so thank god it was a dream but the pain is still there the pain actually took place the knife was not real the person attacker was not real the dream was not real but the pain was real the point is that experience of pain is independent from reality of the physical world you don't need any physical creation whatsoever to create pain similarly you don't need any physical creation to create happiness to create experiences of different kinds you don't need a physical reality at all you can create your physical reality associated with that even a dream like way that's what we do all the time so we use these kinds of traumatic and happy experiences saddled upon our mind impre- imprinted upon our mind to create our own destiny full of pain and pleasure but there is nobody we come across whose life is only full of pain you never met i haven't met anybody whose life is only full of pain nor have i met anybody whose life is only full of happiness why so everybody seems to have some pain and some pleasure and some happiness the answer which the law of karma gives is that destiny to bring you into this kind of physical plane which we call the earth physical earth level that destiny has to be a combination of both if you have such karma such actions that are so terrible that you should be in pain all the time there's another place that means another kind of experience another world you create called hell if you are so happy that you done nothing wrong and you are going to enjoy a bliss forever there's another place another world created by the same mind called heaven if you have done all good things you are perfect you'll be in heaven right now if you done all bad things you go you'll go to hell you cannot come to this place this place is reserved for the mixed karma here we are all products of mixed karma that we have done some good some bad and here we are with our ups and downs so people come and say how can i improve my life i should be happy forever so you can't be here and do that you're in the wrong place go to the right planet <laughs> you came to the wrong place this place has ups and downs in fact in studying the lives of spiritual seekers whose life gets better and better as they live a life of spiritual happiness and knowledge as their awareness grows their life becomes better i found the life doesn't become better in the sense they have no dips at all after that if i were to place life as a straight line here this is a straight ribbon i stretch it out this is life and if we are happy we take it up if we are down we take it down these are the happy occasions the painful occasions happy occasions painful occasions happy I have to keep on going till you die and at the other end is death at this end is birth you find the sine curve you uh, you know students of physics the sine curve of up and down goes all the time this doesn't change if you say i don't like this i don't want to be in this state i want to be in bliss and happiness forever you don't have to come here i'll give you a very sh- a shortcut formula do all good deeds never commit sin be very virtuous never be angry don't hurt anybody you never come here <laughs> you don't like the blissful thing you get bored with bliss okay do all bad things commit sin you go to the other place and have good company <laughs> if you are here you have to have the sine curve up and down why is it important because this is the only place out of these three where you have the illusion of free will that's the beauty of it i appreciate this place the most out of hell earth physical plane and heaven i like this the best why because in this i have the illusion of free will the illusion of making a choice and i can make a choice to seek the truth i can make a choice to find out the truth i cannot do that in hell or in heaven
It's a great opportunity. I can make a choice while in the state, in the physical state of the illusion of free will. I can make a choice to seek the truth that takes me beyond all three worlds. I cannot do that anywhere else. That is why human beings, man of course includes woman. In those days they didn't know how to spell woman so they called man as part of human beings. Man is created in the image of the creator. Have you heard that? Man is created in the image of the creator. In what form? Does God look like this? Does God look like a woman or a man? Or does he have eyes? Does he have limbs? No, that was not the purpose. The statement shows man is created in the image of God, in the image of the creator, because the creator exercises real free will and man exercises the illusion of free will. And nobody else in any creation, any other part of the universe has any of these things. That's the resemblance. Man creates almost the same way like God creates. Except this is illusion. This is not real. Looks like it's an appearance. God creates in reality. The similarity is so strong that man is considered to be the highest form of creation. Higher than all the higher levels of consciousness combined. You can go to heavens. You can go to higher levels of consciousness. You can go to universal mind level. You can go to any level of higher achievement. You can go into a land of eternal bliss. And you do not get this possibility, this opportunity to seek and to make a choice to be a seeker and to be therefore like God. You are in the same image as God by being here on this earth. I love this sign curve which brings me to a position where I can be a seeker. It's a seeking that's the secret of finding. Therefore, it's a great opportunity. We should not constantly criticize the bad luck that comes to us. Oh, I am down. I got sickness. I got this. It's good that you got it. It's good that brought you here. That made you human. That made you a human seeker of the truth. Where else could you find it? I want you to examine this. There is no other point in creation anywhere where you can seek the truth and find it except in the human being, in the human form on the physical plane. There is a great beauty in the sign curve. But then how does spiritual awareness and spiritual knowledge and the grace of the Lord and the grace of the perfect living master, how does that improve your life? It doesn't take away all the sign curve. It picks up this ribbon from here and puts it up there. So that all the curve is still there. But the happiness is now more than previous. The troubles are less than before. They are still there. But you get less trouble. It doesn't affect you. You take it more pleasantly. It doesn't hurt you as much. Eventually you accept it. The state of acceptance changes the whole of that destiny. The destiny is lifted up in a way and the happiness is intensified because of the grace that has lifted you up. But the sign curve still remains. Still giving you the opportunity to exercise your choice and make your destiny. It's the most beautiful situation. You couldn't ask for anything better. To have God's grace in the physical form of a human being is the best thing that could happen to us. And we can get it right here. We don't do it because we commiserate with our other miserable guys. And we think it's great to say how miserable we are. Are you miserable? No, I am not miserable. Boy, damn it, he's not. <laughs> Why isn't he miserable? I come across people who are, who are miserable because other people are not miserable. <laughs> It's a strange life we lead. That because of ignorance. That because we do not understand that the grace of the creator within ourselves, not far away, sitting right inside the seeker, the grace of that creator sitting inside us can shift this whole axis and make the whole life different. So I say that not only do we make our destiny in terms of the ups and downs of life, we make our destiny of shifting the entire axis of our life. We can lift it to a point where our happiness knows no bounds. And people can see it. Yet they can see we fall sick. Yet they can see we have problems. We have financial problems. But we don't cry. We laugh over them. See, we see them in the rightful place. We put them in the right place. And therefore our life is of immense joy. Even while we are still here. And therefore, the real secret of changing the destiny to our advantage, the making of destiny, is first of all, an acceptance of the pattern. 
which is very hard. I must tell you, look simple. It's one word. Have you heard this word acceptance? Anybody heard this acceptance? The importance of acceptance? Those who haven't heard, please hear it now. <laughs> acceptance is the first step towards spiritual development. If you are not willing to accept your destiny, if you are not willing to accept that there is a pattern created on which we can get our spiritual upliftment, if the acceptance is not there, you are living in the illusion of the mind which creates misery. I told you in the beginning that the mind creates doubt and fear and misery. And to get out of the clutches of the mind creating that, you have to have acceptance. Why? Because you will notice that in making your decisions, taking steps in this life, you can take two kinds of steps. Either the step which we call living in God's will or the step which is called living in your own will. There is no third way. Either you live in your own will, which means your mind's will, or you live in God's will. If you live in your own will, you are not accepting. You are trying to constantly change, constantly grumbling, moaning and groaning about everything. I don't like it. I don't want it like this. Okay, try. Try something better. It doesn't work. So what good is it? Except that you create more unhappiness for yourself. You don't change your destiny. I haven't seen anybody changing his destiny by crying about it. I've seen a lot of crying people. They just cry. And ultimately I say, crying must be your destiny. <laughs> they don't change anything. But acceptance, I've seen acceptance changing people's destiny. Because acceptance is unifying, unifying the experiences that you are having in your free will with the plan that has been set up by somebody else's free will, by the creator's free will. If you are lucky enough to go through meditation, through deep introspection, through deep journey within your own self, to the core of your consciousness, if you are lucky to find a practitioner who has done it, whom we call a perfect living master. If you find a human being who has done this and you can go deep into your own self and discover who you really are, you'll have no problem because you'll find that your own reality is the same creator. Therefore, there are no two wills. There was only, only one will. That the fact you thought you were separate from him was the illusion and created a second will. The mental will is an illusion. And was created by your moving away from your own center of consciousness. If you move back to the center of consciousness, you discover there was only one will. One way of doing it is to give up the separation. Why have your own mental will exercised when you can live in God's will? Wherever he is, till we find him. If we find him, great, then we don't have to do anything. Till we find him, why not translate what comes as his will? We accept as our will, make it united, a unison of wills, changes the whole complexion of our destiny. This acceptance helps us to live in God's will. Some people question. They asked uh, a, 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 an Islamic teacher once, Maulana Rome. They asked him, Maulana, how do we know which is God's will, which is our will? After all, everything is God's will, even though our mind may dictate it. And he gave an answer. In his Persian Rubaiyat, in his, in his uh, poems, he gives the answer. He says, people ask me, what is God's will? I tell them it's so simple. If he gives you a spade in your hand, he has expressed his will. What more do you want? If he has created circumstances and coincidences and conditions in your life to tell you what to do, what more do you want? People who have unified their will with God's will see God's messages and letters every day on signboards. They open a book and see the sentence giving a response to what they want to do. They are driving their car and they they watch that billboard every day. They didn't know what it meant. That day it means something. These coincidences of life, these circumstances, this sudden knowledge through a process that is not mental, like intuition, cut knowledge, put all of them together and you will know what his will is and follow it. There's no problem if one starts living in the will of God. There's no problem finding out what that will is. And then that automatically shifts the axis and changes your whole life. You don't have to try this system for too long. You try for one week. I have suggested that truth should not have too long a time to test out. We like to test out truth, you know. 
we like to test out everybody. I found a great master, the great teacher who taught me this. I used to test him every day. I said, if you are real, I am getting late. The train is going to go in three minutes. I have got five minutes to reach there. If you are real, it should be late. I go there, train is five minutes late. Boy, God, you are real. <laughs> Next time, I haven't uh, studied too much. I have to pass the exam. If you are real, God, you'll help me now. <laughs> if the same questions come, the seven questions I have read, read and studied, then you are real. Same seven questions come. Boy, you are real. You keep on testing the Lord all the time. Ultimately, my master turned around to me and he said, What is the purpose of testing? Are you going to move on or just waste your life in testing? It suddenly occurred to me the test should stop at some point and we move on. We are not supposed to be testing all the time. Verifying all the time. For what? To move on. To move on living in a lifestyle, in a way where our will becomes the same as the Creator's will and we improve our destiny while we are still here. In one week the change can be made. You don't have to wait years. You don't have to come in the next lifetime. It's only the clergy, priesthood, the temple priests who advocated. Give us the money. We'll pray for you. You'll get a good life next time. <laughs> Send us a check. You'll go to heaven. <laughs> that's, that's business. It's commercial business. That's not changing your own destiny. You want to give a check to somebody else to change your destiny? No, you don't have to write a check. You have to just make up your own mind to live in that will, which is dictated to us, is visible to us by this strange coincidence. Has anybody had any coincidence of life, coincidence, strange happenings in such a way that we don't ordinarily explain there must be a message in it? And that coincidence is the voice of God. There's no better voice. Don't listen to the voice in your head. That's the voice of your mind. But coincidence is not the voice of the mind, the voice of God. You can live in the will of God and change your destiny right now. How many of you have had these coincidences? The kind I am speaking of. Oh, you are all good seekers. Have you noticed another thing that I noticed in many of my friends? That when you are on the spiritual path, when you are converting your life out of all the messiness that was created, and you want to turn around and lead a spiritual path, as you change over from one style, lifestyle to another, the number of coincidences keep on increasing. You notice that? Anyone? Boy, you understand my language well, because you already had the same experiences. To cut a long story short, destiny is in our hands if we leave it in the hands of the ultimate creator. Because the ultimate creator sits right inside us, is not outside. Destiny is not controlled from outside, it's controlled from the center of our consciousness. If we have access to consciousness, which can be done by meditation, by going within, we can have direct access to knowing how destiny is created. I don't want you to speculate on how destiny is made. I want you to go within and see how destiny is being made. Make it. Thank you very much. Any questions on what I said or failed to say? You can ask me questions on what I presented or what I did not present. Or you can ask me no questions but give me answers. <laughs> to your questions or my questions? Yes. There many people here in heaven heard you explain how to go within and how the mind can override consciousness. Is there anybody here who doesn't know how to go within? Oh, many people don't know how to go within. It's very easy. It's Easy, it's not easy, it's simple. I use the wrong word. It's simple but difficult. It's not easy. We made it difficult. If we don't make it difficult, it's easy. The method of going within is to withdraw your attention to a point behind the eyes where you feel you are, as a unit of consciousness, you are awake. If you close your eyes and figure out where you are, you can notice that you are working in your head as consciousness. In your body, where are you operating from? You can touch your hands, say, no, that's not where I am. You will come over eventually by introspection to your head. In the head also, it's a very narrow space where you will figure out consciousness operating from there. Behind the eyes, somebody calls from here, turn around as if 
as if this movement of the body governs pilot seat that you are occupying. As if you occupy a pilot seat from where you are using this big called the human body that seems to be behind the eyes. Actually, it's a very specific place. If you draw a line between the ears, your own ear, draw a line and draw two lines behind your eyes straight back where they cut a line between the ears. And these two lines sit in the center of that line, sit with your legs, imaginary leg, imaginary body. You sit there. You imagine that you are sitting there. By imagining that you are sitting there, your consciousness gets withdrawn there. The withdrawal of consciousness is quite a different exercise than the focusing of attention. In many processes of meditation, people have been taught how to focus upon something. Concentration of attention has been made synonymous with focusing attention on something. Take, take a picture, take a spot, take something and you focus your attention on something. That doesn't help you to discover your own center because you always focus away from yourself. Any spot you choose to focus your attention upon will be away from yourself. Even if you close your eyes and say, there in front of me is a spot I want to focus on, it's away from you. Focusing attention takes it away from you. Withdrawal of attention brings you back. If you withdraw attention, even momentarily, even for a little moment, at the third eye center, it's called the third eye. That spot I'm telling, if these two fingers represent the eyeballs, where these two fingers meet is approximately the distance in our own head. Where that point is, where we feel we are conscious from in the brain. You could precisely locate that just by your own practice of meditation. If you withdraw your attention to that point by imagining you are there, which makes you forget what's happening outside. If you imagine you are there and you forget what's outside, your attention gets withdrawn back, the light comes out, and all the answers you are looking for are there. That point has been called the third eye center. It's called the single eye. It's the eye behind the two eyes. It's been described in different ways. You must have heard, if thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be filled with light. The reference to that point. It's not reference to any outside thing. It's not reference to a painted eye or something. It's not one of those hippie stuff, you know, which they tried out in the 60s. It's a real place, a center of consciousness. It's a place from where in wakeful state we feel, we are thinking, we are asking questions, we are seeking. The point where we are seeking from is where we have to withdraw attention. Remember the key word is withdrawal of attention, not focusing of attention anywhere. And people make that mistake of closing their eyes and thinking that there they are sitting in the, they see themselves. Little image sitting there and that image is in front of them. You'll be surprised when people close their eyes and meditate inside. They say we are going within and they meditate inside. They make a little image of themselves. Actually, the image is not only at the center of the head. It is not even on the head at all. It's just outside these eyes. It looks inside because we shut these eyes. It's dark. The fact we close these eyes and make darkness does not make it inside. It's still the same room. It's still outside. I, I have a little experiment to suggest to you to check out if you are inside or not. If you close your eyes and see a miniature yourself somewhere there, touch these, uh, touch your eyes with these hands first like this, bring them down. Then make that image and bring them up back. Gradually take these hands back to the eyes. You find before you reach the eyes, you already crossed that point where you are seeing the image. So the image was just outside of the eyes. These kind of uh, image making or focusing on something is not withdrawal of attention. Withdrawal of attention is where you feel. Where are you? You go back to where you actually are. Wherever you are experiencing you are, which is behind the eyes, you withdraw attention. All your thoughts should concentrate on being there. And if you be there, you're filled with light, and you're filled with all the other things. I, haven't, uh, I don't have the time to explain the whole process, but this is just an indication how we can withdraw our attention and get the answers to all the questions. You don't need to attend any more lectures, any more seminars, go anywhere else if you can go to the real temple and get the real answers, which is within yourself. Any other comment? Yes. You're, you're uh, happy and you're loving and you're tolerant and you're patient and you're kind and you reach the heaven world. Haven't you already come upon truth? Enjoy it. <laughs> so, I mean, there's no need to think. Absolutely. 
So then the earth plane is not necessarily the best place to be. Not necessarily. Oh, okay. <laughs> Let me tell you, why do people seek? People don't seek out of happiness. People seek out of unhappiness. And I tell you another story. Real story. I see many people looking happy. So happy, they're enjoying, they've got good cars, limousines, and they're very in good shape and healthy, and they're going skiing, and they look so, boy, they're happy. Then I go and spend two days with them. They're so unhappy. They're hidden their unhappiness. I spend one week and I run away. <laughs> you just have to spend more time with these people. But if somebody has achieved happiness, what else do you want? Enjoy it. It's great. People are looking for happiness. People are not caring for truth. They want happiness. They want truth in order to be happy. They want a higher state of consciousness to get away from the misery of this world. If the world is not miserable, enjoy it. You're lucky. You've done a good karma. Enjoy while it lasts. When it finished, then start seeking. Because after all, a cake cannot last forever. You can keep on eating it, slices, enjoy it. When it is finished, you will go back and bake it again. So we may have made some good destiny and there are a lot of good spots in it. Enjoy it while it is there. Incidentally, those who seek the truth, they gradually become very happy because that axis shifts and they see happiness even in what we think is suffering. The whole life changes. A lot of it is change in attitude. Attitude is a very important thing. We call it sanskar. In the East, we call it sanskar. Sanskar means the attitude we are born with. The difference between sanskar and karma is karma is related to events that took place because of our intentions. Attitude is born out of several lifetimes. The accumulated karma of several lifetimes holds on and keeps on building upon the same attitude again and again. Karma changes. Attitude is very difficult to change. What happens when the axis is lifted by spiritual lifestyle, your attitude changes. And then the attitude towards so-called deprivation changes. People who are so unhappy because they didn't have a certain amount of dollars are happy at what they have. The attitude changes. I did a study on happiness at Harvard. The professor said, this is not in our curriculum. So said, what? There's a quest for happiness going all over the world and you don't have a syllabus on happiness? Okay, if you are a, a university of this kind of uh, openness that I've heard about, let me prepare a paper on happiness. They allowed me. So I tried to list what makes people happy. I prepared a questionnaire and used it in the Boston area, the Cambridge and Boston area. I distributed those questionnaires to about 1,000 people, rich and poor, all kinds of people I met and gave them the questionnaire to fill up. What makes you happy? What are the factors of happiness? What are the factors of unhappiness? What makes you unhappy? They all listed out, if you have a good home, you've got a lot of money, you've got good wife, good children, you've got good family, good friends, you're happy. If you don't have a good home, you're in poverty, you don't have good children, they don't listen to you, you know, the wife divorces you and all those negative things happen, you're unhappy. They almost gave the same answers. I was very happy, it's a universal situation. And then I checked up with each one of them separately. Those who said, if we have a big home, if we have a nice car, if we have a lot of these goodies and a lot of money, we'll be happy. I first met them. I wanted to meet the happy ones first. They were the most miserable. <laughs> I asked a man who had $10 million. I said, you have wealth of $10 million and even on terms of money, you are unhappy. Why? He says, you know, I graduated from this university. I got my MBA. I got a doctoral degree in business. I set up this business. I worked hard. And I reached this point. Look at Bob. He never went to school. He's made 15 million. You expect me to be happy? The same 10 million is the cause of his unhappiness. Because he's comparing with somebody else. Bob is responsible for his happiness or unhappiness. So it's an attitude. We create an attitude. So then I discovered that the same thing went all the way around. In every area. People with acceptance, who were grateful to God for what they had got, were happy with less, less things. And people who had a lot, but compared themselves to others who had more, were unhappy. So I gave them a formula. I said, I'll give you a prescription for happiness. Whatever you have less, look at those who have still less. You'll be happy. If you want to be unhappy, 
even if you have a lot look at those who are still more you'll be unhappy we live by comparison we are trying to catch up with the joneses all the time and joneses are creating our unhappiness <laughs> i thought our karma created unhappiness and jones is doing it <laughs> so therefore the happiness and unhappiness here is so much a matter of comparison if somebody is lucky to ha- to be happy congratulations keep it up you surely have some spiritual background which is giving you that i can tell you that but don't meddle with it the happiness you have but if you don't have it there's a formula by which you can get it anything else i think there's an object who oh, yes that's a good question is there an objective there's a purpose you mean the purpose right is there a purpose or objective to this karma yes it appears that's the uh, consensus among students of karma that the objective of karma is a learning process and evolution in awareness itself that awareness goes through a learning process and goes through a state of growth just like the body grows just like other things grow everything evolves the consciousness in a certain way also evolves and the best evolution takes place through learning process and karma is one of the best learning schools there are collective objectives the collective objective is to have a totality of experience totality of experience because how can we define god in scientific terms or psychological terms you would call him totality of consciousness it's a good definition where there's no individuation no separation if totality of consciousness is the creator and there is no one else by assumption that's the only being totality of consciousness the only experience which can be generated collectively through evolution would be totality of learning and experience looks like a big show set up by the single spectator who doesn't like to be alone and has created the illusion of the many splendidly placed right <laughs> yes does not mean that in a lower dimension our own experience doesn't have to be an illusion because by being non-individuated after death that becomes a whole separate plane so our individuation as beings here doesn't have to be an illusion in other words if we were all in a big chess game and we have the choice to make a move as a pawn or the choice to make a move as a bishop isn't it just as real as anything else on that we would sense as being reality it's got to be an illusion <laughs> very deep very deep question very deep question and it has been answered in one of the texts in one of the upanishads upanishads were commentaries upon the vedas the vedas are the oldest books in sanskrit giving this knowledge in one of the upanishads it questions the need for illusion why should something be illusion and something be real what what's the purpose like he said there's a purpose of karma what is the purpose of creating something that is an illusion and it describes illusion as maya or mithya maya is a different definition of illusion than we normally understand by illusion we say unreal is that a correct definition but maya or the illusion of life is not unreal it is real i'm just saying it diminishes the god of all states i am going to explain that i'm just going to explain that illusion as maya illusion that it exists is not unreal the experience of the world as we are having is real but the world is not real that's the illusion it doesn't mean well who can say if somebody says it's unreal that you are having an experience you say well, how can you say that i'm having it <laughs> the experience of having something is real it's actually happening it's not illusion but that experience leads to the conclusion that the world must exist physically that's the illusion so here we are in a state that we are having a real experience of an unreal world and that's called maya it's not that the whole thing is unreal the actual experience going on is actually happening to us so it's a real experience it's as real as the experience of being in heaven or any other dimension if we can have the experience of any other dimension it's still an experience it's an experience of consciousness all experiences of consciousness are real as experiences of consciousness but the assumption that follows from that that because we have an experience of consciousness the world physically must be real that is the illusion let me give an example here is a cup there it is 
here is a cup of water i am going to drink it to see if it is real hmm tastes good must be avia is it some good spring water i just tasted it can anybody say that my tasting of the water was illusion <laughs> no way i just tasted it the tasting of the water was not illusion my seeing of the cup in my hand is no illusion my holding the cup is no illusion it's an experience but from the experience to assume that independent from my experience there is a cup of water that's the illusion there's no cup of water besides my experience it's a very subtle point it's very subtle it's just like having a dream you have a dream and you have an orange juice in your hand you drink the orange juice you get the taste of orange juice the drinking of the orange juice the dreaming of the orange juice is real you just got it you wake up the drinking the experience of drinking orange juice is still real in a dream like state the cup of orange juice was not the drinking was still real so in different dimensions when we have experiences they are real and that is how the evolution the learning process goes on through experience not through a three dimensional creation of objects outside that the illusion is that we we have to create very nicely explained in the tukmishad when we have an experience here which is real we take it as real but the world need not be taken as real and when we go to another dimension we discover that the reality is of the experience not of the world when either in this dimension or in the other dimension there was a chinese philosopher fa hi whatever his name was fa li a good chinese name fa hi had a dream in the dream he felt he was a butterfly and he was flying flitting from flower to flower in the garden so beautiful he was smelling the flowers and enjoying himself and he woke up and he found he wasn't the butterfly it was pali the philosopher but it occurred to him in a deep way how can he be sure that he is pali the philosopher who dreamt he was a butterfly and that he is not a butterfly who dreamt who is now dreaming that he is pali <laughs> how can you find the difference but the investigators of consciousness those who go within to the area of consciousness to discover how a dream is created or how a wakeful dimension is created or how a higher post death astral experience is created they discover that all of them are created from the same source of consciousness there's no other substance from which to make any of these worlds except consciousness so when they discover that you can create different dimensions of creation and the substance to make them is still the same which is consciousness they come to know the truth it's not the change in the shift in the dimension that gives you reality the connection between one and the other is that both are real experiences point a point at issue is which i have raised many times if a man were to dream that in a dream is a bird and flies out of a window let's take a dream where a person is dreaming that i am a bird with wings and i fly out of the window and wake up and tell our friends you know i dreamt i was a bird and i was flying out of the window our friends say you are not a bird you are nowhere near a bird you don't have feathers you don't have how do you know you are the bird you should say that you saw a bird flying in a dream why are you saying you are the bird you can't be a bird there's no identification between a bird and you but the person says i didn't see any bird <clears throat> i was flying i had wings i was the bird how are you sure that was you because it was me <laughs> i was a dreamer i was the bird that's a great clue that the experiencer always is the self the same self that whatever dimension you get into supposing you go into higher dimension where there is no physical form but just a cloud you will know you are the same cloud who are the same human being the identification of experiencer is never lost and remains the same in fact that is so subtle a point and so important a point that the self never changes even if all experience and dimensions change that people have called self as the only reality in one of the definitions of reality in the east they have tried to define reality as that which never changes because if something changes how can it be real in the long run only that thing can be real which never changes 
and they look around. The whole world is changing. Everything is changing. Our body is changing. We are dying, bo being born. This is not real. If everything that is changing is unreal, what is not changing? Examine carefully. Is there something not changing at all in this changing world and changing creation? The only thing that is not changing is the self that is witnessing this change. The self that is watching this change has never changed. The whole life changes and the self remains the same. The self was in the human form. The self is in the higher form. Self, after death, the body died and the self survived. The body was recreated. The same self survives. The body goes. You go to a higher region. The same self survives. You go to totality of self, totality of consciousness. The same self survives. Self is the only reality. That's why it is said self-realization is the same. It's one step short of God-realization. Whoever has realized the nature of the self has realized God. Because the self has never changed. The self is the substance of consciousness which can create real experiences. The real experiences create dimensions. The real experiences create levels of creation. The real experiences create death and a life after death. It's only an experience. The self that is going through the experience never changes. So, is that light? It hardly matters. The connection between one experience and the other is continuous through the self. If the self is the same, there is a link between the physical experience and any other experience at higher dimensions. Yes? Uh, are there any questions? I have a doubt. Uh, but my main one is, if we have to deal with our death, then why are we here... Learning to improve our destiny. We improve our destiny all the time. That's all we learn. We learn how to improve our destiny. We learn how to make our destiny non-physical. We make our destiny eventually the truth of the one total consciousness. We can learn the whole thing through a process of learning. But I feel that we are changing our destiny by studying for... Sure. Sure, that's the purpose. That's the purpose of being here. That's the purpose of being here. We are doing it. I agree with you. Can't it be part of your destiny? Can't hmm? it be part of your destiny? It is part of it. Yes, we, we, whatever, whatever uh, arrangements we make for learning, we put into our destiny. Because if we don't put into our destiny, they don't become part of our life. So any learning process has to be built into destiny. Because I was going to ask something similar to that when you're talking about the string and the, and the sign curve. Can't we be happy along the highs and the lows of the sign curve? Because we can realize our destiny is pulling us that way and therefore learning from all those highs and lows and, and that happiness can be throughout if you realize what all that is bringing you. When that realization comes, I call it shift of the axis. The same thing. Yes. Yes, there's a question about um, free will and destiny. I was always under the impression that certain things are our destiny that's going to happen to us in this lifetime, but how we handle it is our free will, whether we would uh, choose to forgive or have resentment. Is that the way it is? How That's very true. It? That's very true. Mm -hmm. As I said, in life, most of the areas of our life, timings of our life are packed with destiny. In between, we are given little choices how to handle them. Right, or we meet certain people or right. certain experiences. We have that destiny. How we react to them. How we, how we act in new situations. That's all part of our Free will, free will and learning process, right? right? That's right. Mm -hmm. Yes. How do you tell who someone was in your past life? You can tell yourself by regression into your past life, by simple process of memory. Memories, everything is there. Total memory is there. And the best, best place to access memory is in the mind. That's where it's held. Yes. I find it leads to confusion, though, because if you were really in love with someone in your other life, then it was tragic, and then you meet him again, and I'm going to cry, and you're in love with him again, and you marry them this time. But it's terrible. It is terrible. It's terrible because they're awful. They're not the same person. Their personality is different, but it's the same person, and you still love them, it's but you terrible. hate them. <laughs> it's like a movie, grade B, you know? I, That's the only way you learn. Is there a better way to I learn? Forced them. Huh? <laughs> I don't know better way of learning. This is the this is the best way. It's a, it's called it's called an intensive condensed course in learning. 
When this kind of karma comes, we are learning fast. That this is not real. I'll tell you. What, what is the learning? The learning is that this kind of so-called love in attachment relationships is not real. It takes time to learn. Once we learn, we all learn it. These are attachments. We must learn to distinguish between attachment and love. Love is not the same thing as attachment. We are calling attachments as love. We get attached to people because of our desires, because of our... You know, what is the, uh, what's the difference? In attachment, you say, I love you. What are you doing for me lately? <laughs> it's a business. <laughs> Where is the love? In love, you forget yourself. You are totally the beloved. You identify with the beloved and that's love. Love is the only experience which makes you forget your ego. Attachment enhances your ego. Attachment makes me say, I did so much for him. What did he do for me? I am so, I did all this for you. Is this what I expect from you? They call it, this is love talk. No, there's attachment. There's attachment. And to learn the distinction between attachment and love is a very good learning process and goes through karma again and again. And the best way to learn is to get married. <laughs> Very good, condensed course. It's an intensive, yes. In your opening statements about uh, doubt and uncertainty. And I thought later on when you talked about being centered, that when you were centered in yourself, that uh, I'm assuming that there's no doubt and uncertainty. That's true. If in my everyday life, I don't experience the world centered. I might experience it through a rational process. I might experience it intuitively. I may experience it metaphysically. I may experience it with common sense. Then I cannot help but be uncertain when I'm experiencing the world those levels. No. Intuitive, metaphysical is certain. Rational thinking is uncertain. You are using two different faculties in your own consciousness. But that's, that's the reality. Yeah, it's the reality. Each component. Of Each component. The work. Right. I'll tell you the difference. I'll tell you the difference. When you live your life, there are two distinct parts of your conscious process that you are using. One is the mental process. The mental process is basically thinking, reasoning, logic, sensing. You know how sensing takes place. We think sensing means uh, you use sensory perceptions. But I am talking of interpreting the sensory perception. If you merely see a chair, it doesn't become a chair unless you interpret it as chair. It's just a blob of different colors and forms. How does it become a chair? It becomes a chair because the mind interprets the senses and says it's a chair. The sensing process, the logical process, the reasoning process is all a mental and creates doubt and creates fear. Then beyond that is a process called intuitive process. The process of suddenly knowing that feeling. That's not mental at all. In fact, very often it goes against the mental process. The reasoning process is saying one thing and the intuitive process is no. You don't know why. People say we have a gut knowledge. This is not going to happen. Why? All the logical reasons say it should. I don't know why. I don't explain why. But it's, I know it's not going to happen. Where is that coming from? The intuitive process picks upon the whole totality of your background and consciousness and picks from there what you need then. It doesn't rationalize and pick up pieces joined together. Now I'll tell you the difference between the two. You will notice love, intuition, metaphysical experience does not occur in time. Can't say it takes two minutes or takes two seconds. Just spontaneous. The other process, reasoning and thinking always takes time. Even the smallest thought takes time. Think about it, it takes time. Reasoning, the mental faculties are all confined to a time, space, causation framework. You have to think logically in a cause and effect time-space relationship. You cannot think outside of it. The metaphysical experience of intuition and knowledge comes without that framework. And we have the experience all the time of both. Similarly, attachments are in mental time. And love is not. Love is spontaneous. So you will find there is a certain part of our conscious process which is spontaneous and does not create doubt and fear. And there is a certain part which is working in time and creates doubt and fear. The, the good, good combination would be use the intuitive process to make your decisions. 
and then use the mind and all the rational process how to carry them out. You'll have a very good life. Can we find a place for something called divine revelation? Well, that's intuition. In truth, it's covered by that. It's covered by that. You can make it in a category, but I covered it in that. Yes. I'm just I'm trying to think how I can share something briefly that has helped me many ways in recognizing that my being sealed is an illusion. Okay, even though I'm real and everybody can see me, my being sealed is an illusion. And one of the ways that it has helped me to remove myself or to recognize the fact that a lot of this is an illusion, to point out, is to recognize that sometimes when I'm watching a movie, um, sitting in my, my living room and I'm watching TV and a very sad scene, if I'm attached at all to the players or even to the um, theme of the uh, movie, I'll find myself crying, I'll find myself laughing, whatever it is, caught up in the illusion that feel. When I recognize, of course, the movie's over, the TV's off, I will take a minute and look at that. Life is the same thing. When I'm caught up in something at work, for instance, things are really bothering, miserable and stay, and you know, if I can remove myself in the same way and recognize doing job, world, and this experience is an illusion. And I am going through this experience. It's when I go from down here to up here. That's you know? good. Great. You know, Thank you for sharing. What she's saying is, if you have the capacity to look at this world like a movie, you will immediately improve your destiny. <laughs> That's... <laughs> we are looking at movies all the time. This is the greatest movie ever directed and produced. Is right around us. And if you realize, it's a great movie, a great show, and we are actors in that, and also audiences in that. It's a great participative movie going on. And we know we are playing our act. That what we are saying is the script. It changes our life. Yes. As we're looking at the movie, does this, as we're looking at the movie, how should we look at the other actors who are playing the part of the baddie? We should look as we look in the movie where we pay seven dollars and look at the baddies. <laughs> Same way. Same way, yes. Clarify them. The question is what is this concept of time, space, and causation? Is that right? Distance. Time and distance. What is time and distance? Time and distance are created through a process of consciousness called attention. You heard of attention? When attention is used in analytical form, that means in broken fragments, which the mind helps it to do, it goes from now to now to now creating time. When attention is used in this fragmented form, in understanding experience, from here to there to there, it creates distance. Only the attention the divided attention that creates time and distance. And that makes experience miserable. If you did not fragment it, but saw the whole thing with undivided attention, it would be happy. I'll give you an example. If you have a painting, there's no painting here. If you have a large painting, beautiful painting, and you cut the painting with a scissors, pair of scissors, into small one-inch squares, and put them all the, on the table. The whole painting is on the table. You can look up at all those strips again and again. You never see the whole painting because you fragmented it. The mind with this analytical ability fragments everything by putting attention one at a time and therefore creates time. One at a place and therefore creates distance. The soul on the other hand, the conscious process that is beyond the mind looks at the whole thing collectively through synthesis. Takes a sweeping view of the whole thing. Therefore finds it more joyous. And the whole picture, the joy of looking at the whole movie, the joy of looking at the picture comes back. It's divided by attention. Does Eastern understanding have an explanation as to why uh, the learning aspect and the greater consciousness became necessary in the first place? They said that the, the one alone, single being must have been lonely and created a creation where all aspects of consciousness could be played out resulting back in the totality. It was a will, it was a play, 
of the single consciousness in order to remain conscious. Is it of the creator or of the created? Creator. Because it happened within the creator, there was no distinction between the creator and the created. That's an Eastern point of view. That the creator, how, how do you call the God creator? There has to be a creation. There's no creator and this is a creation. If the creation is all illusion and is taking place inside the creator, there's no difference between the two. So the creator and the created are in fact at the same spot. And in a way are identical according to Eastern concept, which is very, in, uh, very plausible that they are both the same and are set up for the purpose of the soul enjoyment of the soul creator. If you can use the word enjoyment, they can use any other word too. That's the concept. It was the single divine will to set the whole thing in motion in different forms, mental forms, time frames, without time frame, creations without time. The reason for assuming that this could have happened is that the spiritual journey from illusion, from where we are, to reality where the creator or our real self is, spiritual journey takes us through all the different forms of creation that have taken place to make the play entertaining. And we can see it as we go along. Yes? You want me to cover all the textbooks today? <laughs> okay. Okay. The, the question is that I should uh, uh, briefly describe the difference between the mind and uh, consciousness uh, per se and how mantra or repetition of words helps us. When I explained earlier that withdrawal of attention can take us to our source, to the center, I made it look easy. And I said it's not easy, it is simple. It is simple because it is so close to us, it's all within ourselves, we don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to go to a particular church, the church is with you, you carry it with you. So you can withdraw attention within your own body. But I used the wrong word in the beginning to say it's easy, because it's not easy. We have scattered ourselves through the mind by attachment and desire to so many things that when we close our eyes to meditate and pull ourselves back, all these thoughts and images come in front of us and distract us again. The greatest problem in meditation is that when we try to meditate, all the other ideas, especially derived from our attachments or mental attachments, they come back to us. How do we get rid of them? Our mind is a chatterbox. Have you ever seen that the mind keeps speaking all the time? The mind thinks and speaks in words all the time. It doesn't rest content with just watching a movie. doesn't content with just watching pictures. If you have an imagination, the mind speaks about that imaginary thing. Even of ordinary things like sense perception. You see a chair and the mind says, there's a chair. Well, we know it already. Why are you telling me? Have you noticed that? The mind is a constant commentator. It never stops. It's a constant narrator of what's going on, how this is happening. Now, never stops at all. It doesn't even stop when we sleep. So this mind, which is a chatterbox, and is constantly speaking. Through speaking, it draws other images in front of us and distracts us from our meditation, distracts us from withdrawing to the third eye center. So the Eastern mystics, they designed some simple methods to take care of this problem. And one of them was a mantra. A mantra is some chant of holy words. Holy words because they be given by a holy person. You could pick up any other word. But if we pick up any words, they all have an association of idea with something that we know. So we go to an alien, a foreign person. He gives us such strange Sanskrit words. We never heard. We don't know what they mean. And we repeat them. They have no meaning for us except that while we are repeating them, and our attention is on listening to those words, they squeeze out the words of the mind which was creating the distraction. So it's a placebo that is being put into to get rid of the toxins. So as the, uh, the mind's thinking, those words keep on bothering us and interfering, repetition of the mantra takes care of that by pumping in these bland words into the thought stream and thereby pushing out the other words and thereby it becomes easier to center ourselves in. 
Yes. And the difference between that and um, attachment. attachment. Could you elaborate on that? You know, for example, this woman here was talking about her husband. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you I can talk freely now. <laughs> I always question in my mind, if you're in a relationship like that, can you just choose to love that person and accept them as they are, even though emotionally you're so anxious and angry about it? And how does love relate to that kind of relationship? Let me start with relationship. It's a great relationship to practice acceptance. So you should accept as they are. Not because of love, but because of acceptance. It's a great learning process for experiencing acceptance. That you accept a person you are associated with so closely, like a husband and wife. You accept them as they are because that's a great spiritual experience of acceptance. Not of love. Now we come to love. Love is always spontaneous. You cannot choose to love. When you choose to love, it's not love. That's a mental activity. You're cultivating something. When you love, you don't even think. You don't want to love and you fall in love. When you love, you forget yourself. You're so absorbed by the one you love. Love can truly be defined as an experience of identification with the other. You begin to identify yourself with the other. Somebody else is doing something that absorbs your consciousness and not what you are doing. That's love. That doesn't happen by cultivation. It's not a mental exercise. But acceptance comes very well through these relationships. But both are good. If love comes, don't destroy it by thinking about it. And if husbands and wives come, don't destroy them by not accepting it. Accept the husband and wife and enjoy, rejoice in the love, which is spontaneous. Yes. Another kind of love and for your children. Uh, and out of that love, you want to teach them. So in fact, that's changing them. That's a duty. That's an obligation and a duty which is the will which you should carry out because you're a mother. Even after they enter adulthood? <laughs> as long as you feel, as long as you feel that they will listen to you. <laughs> so, it's no good. <laughs> It's no good, it's no good teaching somebody who won't listen to you. It has no effect. It's no use giving advice to a person who doesn't want your advice. Don't waste it. But give good advice, give good instruction, do your duty when they listen. When they stop listening, retire from advising. Retire from advising, not otherwise. <laughs> Anything else? Yes. Feeling or her dreams have come true. And then again, I have very many creative dreams and such feelings that I don't know whether to take them seriously, seriously or not. Sometimes I overlook them. And I was wondering if there's a way of knowing when they're just dreams or when they're messages, warnings. Take all that feeling seriously. All of them. And you won't regret it. They are always more reliable than all the thinking plans that we make. They don't come true. The gut feelings are more reliable. What about dreams? Well, dreams, it depends. You have to interpret a dream. Dreams are, are of many kinds. If a dream is of one color, ignore it. If a dream is of multicolor with yellows and blues in it, follow it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not joking. I'm not kidding. There are two kinds of dreams. There are dreams that the mind makes from a continuum of activities of the wakeful state. Whatever we are thinking of in the wakeful state, we go to sleep, we keep on thinking about it, it becomes a dream. You would find that dream has only one color. It's a buff color dream. You look at the dream again next time, you don't see some brilliant yellows and blues in that. It's all in the red region, all in the buff color, skin color. As if you throw light on your eyelids and that color that you see, the dreams take the same color when it's just a continuum of your wakeful experience. Ignore them, that's the same mind. But when suddenly a new dream comes, those brilliant colors which cannot be made up by the mind, that's as good as intuition or gut feeling. Well, what about, for instance, 
Like, I always figure, well, the ones that stick out in my mind the most are the ones that constantly all day. Those are the ones I end up taking seriously. Sometimes there's ones that are really, I mean, like you said, color and very vivid. I could, I feel like I'm looking at it right now if I think about it. But they're not positive, and they make me worry. And I just, there's nothing with like that. Take the colored dream seriously, but don't worry about anything. You have to give up worrying. Because worry doesn't get you anything. Worry has never helped anybody. I have found worry makes us weak. Doesn't make us strong to deal with it. Give up worry and take the colored dream seriously. The vivid dreams. Okay? Yes. And then elimination of doubt is your mantra. So that it becomes something where you need the doubt in order to transform what you call blind faith into living faith. How can you then make doubt bendable? Well, if doubt is an integral part of your growth process, it will come automatically. You don't have to cultivate doubts. We already have so many. We already have too much. We don't have to... There are some weeds. There are some weeds that are terrible. Those weeds keep on growing. We pluck them out. Somebody, a gardener told me, Oh, it's very easy to know which is a plant and which is a weed. Pull it out. If it grows again, it's a weed. <laughs> we are surrounded by these weeds around us. We don't have to create any more. There are enough to help us grow. Already enough. There's an interesting story. Very interesting story. I would like to conclude with that story. I hope you like it from the East. A story of a gardener who plants a little, a small little plant, sapling. A little plant and so small. You know how they put that little sapling? What is it called? Seedling. Seedling. They put, he was putting a little seedling and very fondly putting little fertilizer around it and taking a little can and putting water on it. And a young man was watching this. He said, man, you're wasting your time. Do you see this little seedling you're putting in there is all surrounded by weeds. You are watering the weeds. You are giving your fertilizer and food to the weeds, not to your plant. The gardener looks up. Young man, have you ever planted this? He says, no, I haven't, but I can see the folly of what you are doing. He says, that is because you haven't had any experience with this little seedling. I have planted it before. And I tell you, this is a very nice, strong plant. When I plant it, this little seedling, and give it water and food and fertilizer, of course, the weeds are also being fed. The weeds are taking advantage of my food and my water. But this little seedling keeps on growing becomes bigger and bigger and the weeds remain the same size. Later on, this little seedling becomes like a bush and becomes so big and then it casts a shadow, a shade over the weeds and the weeds wither and die. And I've seen this happen before. The young man was surprised because the gardener was a master and what he was planting was not a plant but love and the heart of a seeker. And he discovered that when love is planted by a true spiritual teacher in the heart of the seeker, there are so many desires, so many attachments surrounding it, that the love that the master is giving is also feeding those weeds. He's also feeding. And people say, Master, you're great. Let me get this money quickly. Master, great. Let me fulfill this ambition. He lets them get fulfilled. His purpose is not to make you more money. His purpose is not to give you more material wealth. His purpose is not to heal you in this world. His purpose is to take you to a higher level. But he feeds all this, these weeds. But the plant of love keeps on growing and becomes like a big bush inside. And when the plant is big, the, the seeker says, I want nothing but your love. I don't care for these worldly things. And the weeds wither and die away. Thank you very much.